At this point, I'd like to review the five stages of the swing. I'd like to cover some important tips and observations that I picked up through my college experiences. First of all, when we start off here, I'd like to get into stance. And as we get into the stance, I'd like you to think as being a, a bicycle. You're going to make yourself into a bicycle. You've got 10 gears in this bicycle. Now, as we get into stance and we have 10 gears, we're quiet. We've got some rhythm here, and we're in first gear. Okay? Now, as we get in first gear, we're going to also stay in first gear when we load. We're also going to go into the first gear when we take a stride. Now, the point to really bear down on is we want to get into the 10th gear as we start to swing. Now, the aspects we need to understand here is as we start to swing, we need to have the important parts of the mechanics of the swing down. So, as we, to get the swing into 10th gear correctly, we need to squish the bug correctly. So as I squish that bug with the back foot, I need to feel the, the ball of my back foot on top of the bug and the back heel high off the ground and close the gap between my knees. Now as I'm doing that, I need to imagine that the barrel of the bat is point A, the hands are point B, and the ball is point C. I can allow the hands to swing the bat correctly if I squish the bug correctly. If I just spin on the back foot like this, I didn't close the gap up, an A to C swing is impossible having the hands in the wrong position to, to try to produce an A to C swing is also impossible. So I need to imagine that the barrel of the bat is going to go to the ball A to C correctly, but to have that happen correctly, I have to have my elbows sitting on an imaginary table. This table sitting right here, so when I get in my stance, the elbows are sitting right on the table. There's a pencil underneath my front elbow. So when I'm in first gear right here, I'm going to take and get into the load and pull that rope that's attached from my front knee to my hands back, that front elbow is going to draw on the table and actually both elbows stay on the table when it happens. But as I draw on the table right there, there's an imaginary eye on my front shoulder that has to stay focused on the pitcher and cannot go off the pitcher. So I'm taking that eye on that front shoulder as I pull that rope and I go from in, staying in first gear and I go back with the hands, that eye stays right on the pitcher. If it does not, what will happen is the hands probably went back here, I barred the front arm, I got myself in trouble and lost a good position to hit in, okay? The other thing you want to notice is I want to keep my front elbow, okay, inside or in front of my belly button. If that front elbow passes the belly button, the, ar the front arm is going to bar and lose that good hitting position, or it's going to turn that front shoulder so much that my eyes are not going to be able to stay focused on the ball. So that's an important point to realize. So we got the bicycle right here. We're in first gear. We got some rhythm. We're going to load in first gear, take our stride in first gear. Now, to go to A to C correctly, barrel the bat is point A, hands point B, the ball's point C. Barrel goes from A to C, squish the bug, close the gap. A to C contact with the ball right now. Now, after we make contact, our eyes stay in contact area, going to roll the wrist, okay? Now, if I want to, after the wrist is rolled, I can let the barrel, I can let the hand, the top hand go off the barrel of the bat and continue, continue through with that top hand to the opposite shoulder and the barrel of the bat continue through with the follow through. And I want a flat follow through with the barrel of the bat. The barrel of the bat should not finish above the top of my head and it shouldn't finish much below my front shoulder, which is my left shoulder right here. Now, the other option is when I make contact with the ball and after I roll the wrist, is to hold on with both hands. The barrel of the bat continues through. The elbows need to bend after the wrists are rolled and come through here. The problem that often happens is if somebody keeps that front arm or top arm extended all the way through, it's almost impossible for the eyes to stay focused on the ball. We tend to develop habits where we pull off the ball, and a lot of times that happens when somebody tries to become a dead pull hitter. So we want to let the elbows bend, come through right here, and with a flat follow through. And the reason we have a flat follow through with that barrel finishing above our back shoulder and below the top of our head with both hands on the bat, the reason for that is we want the hips and shoulders working together. If I have a high follow through, what happens is the hips and shoulders are going to be fighting against each other and I have a swing that's very awkward, doesn't have a lot of rhythm in it, and we have some problems even in drills that we're trying to perform not only on the field too. So that's something we need to keep in mind as a hitter. So real quickly, first gear 
in the bicycle right here. Elbows on the table, got a pencil underneath the front elbow. Pull the string back here. We're still in first gear, front elbow stays in front of the belly button. Take a stride, hands stay back, both elbows on the table, hands in good position to hit from right here. Now, when I take that stride, the front heel is gonna lead towards the pitcher, but I don't want that heel being way off the ground. We want to step soft, but we, want, we don't want, do not want to have that front heel so high off the ground that when we try to swing, we have a hard landing. Okay, so I can actually take a stride and have that heel touch the ground as I take the stride as long as it's a soft landing. And then we want to squish the bug properly and make contact with the ball, roll the wrist, have a flat follow through, and I stay in the contact area. We've got the hips and shoulders working together. We produce a pretty good swing. Now, for all that to happen on a consistent basis in drills and in the game, we need to know when everything starts. When you're talking about hitting, you look out there in the, in the mound and you see the pitcher throwing the ball. If the pitcher's throwing 85 to 86 miles an hour, you have about four tenths of a second, okay, from the time the ball is released to the time it hits the plate. Now that four tenths of a second can be split into two tenths of a second. It takes from the barrel of the bat to get to the ball, okay? But the problem is a lot of hitters, they try to put the load and the stride and the swing and everything in that four tenths of a second. The good hitters are already going to have the load out of the way before that ball is released, okay? And that, that's something that you really need to bear down and understand why they're doing that. If a per person's throwing really hard, we're going to go off of what the pitcher tells us as visual cues. Their physical movements are going to tell us when we're going to start our load. So if a pitcher's throwing 85 to 86 miles an hour, about the time that they separate their hands is, okay, is going to be about the time their body starts coming at us. That's going to be about the same time we're going to start a load. Now, if a pitcher's not throwing quite that hard, you might start your load about when the ball gets up in here. Okay, and if you're even throwing slower, it might be a little bit later. So you do all your timing based on what the physical actions of the pitchers are. So you need to understand that so you have a consistent rhythm day in and day out as a hitter.